Thanks, Marshall. Welcome everyone to today's Q&A. My name is Gary Gerber. I'll be hosting today and Alex Manriquez will be driving documents for us. So as we're asking questions, sometimes we'll have the documents up on the screen to help explain and answer questions. Don't really have a lot of big announcements today or actually really any, it's kind of a slow week for us. Thank goodness, it's nice to get a little bit of a break. Uh, end of year's right around the corner though. And the dates for end of year, uh, when it starts is gonna be May 8th. Uh, you could be uploading data in some cases. In some cases, there's, you're gonna have to wait till the school's out, but, uh, but the actual processing for end of year will begin May 8th. And the deadline for the initial deadline is July 28th. And then there is an amendment window from the 29th to the 25th of August for end of year. So just keep that in mind. Other than that, I don't have a lot of announcements. Martha, Angela, did you have anything to add? Uh, we did have a deployment going yesterday, Gary, and the known issues and fixed implemented issues is up to date. There were only a couple that went in for production. The, Dev and test folks are working on end of year and uh, SPED redesign project right now and data discrepancies as well. Great. And we will get started. First question is, uh, the first one I see listed here is from Mary Masters, Q1. Looking at the CTE user guide, and there's the link for the user guide, each industry sector has introductory courses 999 that can lead to any pathway in that sector. Example on page six, does course 7100 count A as a participant or B toward the 300 hours required to along with the capstone course to be a completer? And you have a question too, and we'll, we'll circle back to that, which probably will be no problem. I, if I can jump in, Gary. Okay. <laughs> the the seven thousand one, it's uh, exploratory, and this one does not contribute to the three hundred hours. Um, so all the other ones, though, can contribute to the three hundred hours. Um, and I don't know if that ends if that's just part of her question. Okay. It was seventy one hundred specifically. So right there, I think you answered it. Perfect. And that's that document that was the CTE doc user guide? Yeah, I just clicked on the oh. link that she oh, shared. Okay. Great. Okay, next question is from Cedric. Is the ASVAB being reported this year? I don't know. The armed services um, oh. <laughs> aptitude test. And I'm on their website right now, Cedric. It doesn't say it's not. If you want, you could put in a ticket and we'll send that up to CDE if you just want confirmation that it is happening. Next question, Q1 from George. When will the training videos for the end of year one, two, three, and four be released? Uh, I'm not sure when the, the, the new videos will be released soon. However, there's not a lot of changes from previous end of years. So you, you could easily go to the ones that are existing now and Alex is showing you on the screen, and they would definitely work for this this year's submission as well. Yeah, and we try to make sure those videos are up. Once we get a, a good live training started, then we try to get those one of those edited and placed in for you guys. So what that means, our training is not going to happen until the early part of May, that you wouldn't see this year's recordings until likely the end of May. So if you can't wait that long, using last year's is a good substitute. Hey, how are you? Um, that working, what can I say? Adriana, we can hear you. <laughs> someone, someone snuck yeah. through the mute block. <laughs> Next question from Alex. Q1 for error message uh, sped 543. Does this mean that every other field not listed on the fields validated list must be blank or is each fist, uh, field listed should be blank? What is that error? They have to match, right? The incoming to what's already there. 
It has to be oh, blank. Right. Yes. And Alex is showing you that when you bring up the known issue or the the error number, the descriptions, and it gives you uh, in the error description, and she's highlighted right there. Well, oh, so for these three plans, we don't expect those fields to be populated. Okay, question one from Rebecca. Any updates on when the DD report will be available? Uh, it's still to be determined, Rebecca. We hit a snag in trying to start our UAT. And so until we have the UAT, we're not able to turn on the DDs. And once EOI starts, they're kind of not helpful for EOI anyway. Okay, question one from Kevin. The special ed meeting delay code 40, school break is no longer available for eligibility evaluation. If a special ed assessment for a EE starts in November, but is completed beyond the 60 days after the break, do we need no longer need to address that with a meeting delay code? The uh, Valley Code combo, Alex, do you have that handy so we could see what are the possible codes that are, would be you know, available for meeting type 40, I guess? Oh, no, I'm sorry, 10. The 40 is there, school break. So it's, it's not expired or? Yeah. And, and hopefully he's not talking about the sped redesign, but the current. <laughs> right. Wait, I think his question is eligibility evaluations. So that's 40, right? Okay. Let's, well, but the 60 days is actually a initial evaluation though. So, but you're right. We could check. Uh... So the. Eligibility evaluation meeting, which reports to your triennial, <clears throat> is more than 60 days. So I, I, to clarify the, I mean, if you're more than 300, uh, three years, <laughs> right? <laughs> then you can't use school break. I don't think you would be able to. Okay. So that's why it's not a valid code? Yes, that's right. So maybe the initial evaluation is what he was referring to, which is, you know, more than 60 days after that, then you could put, provide your school break there. Okay, thanks, Joe. Question one from Dana. I have a student showing up on the 15.2 as a dropout. They left our district and enrolled in another district. I can see that the other district has them labeled with a school transfer code of five in a district of geographic residence that is not my district. They exited the student with a T-168 and entered one of my school district or one of my districts uh, as the expected school of attendance. Shouldn't they have sent them to a school in their district of residence instead of sending them to the last school that they were enrolled in? Can I contact them to change this expected school so that the student does not show up on my dropout list? Uh, if the student is showing up as a dropout, how soon was that student re-enrolled after they exited? Uh, if they if they re-enrolled before census day, they shouldn't it shouldn't. But if it was after census day, then they might. There's different rules though too, right? He's a county office and just the use of the T-160, don't, doesn't that have different meetings in the cohort at all? Does it take that into account? Yeah, I can't remember off. So somewhere there's logic, business logic, right? Of how they get counted as a dropout. So this is the report mapping. Dana, I don't know if you've ever seen this and it explains the business rules for how we come up with the 
the 1068 is a newer one. Columns. Is that one even included? It? You're right. T167 is. But maybe this hasn't been updated with that change to the cohort. Alex has been working have. on yeah working on it for this <laughs> this upcoming cycle. So um, it doesn't look like Alex that Kyron's pushed out your changes yet. Do you know if you added T168? Oh. Oh, no, not that I can remember. Um, but I'll double check. And maybe, uh, Dana, if you can submit a ticket and say, yeah. attention, Alex, then I can, one, make sure that the uh, updated mapping guide has that T168 in there. But then, two, we can take a look at your specific SSID and figure out why they're pounding as a dropout. Thanks, Alex. Oh, he says a one week later they enrolled. So yeah, we'll definitely want to take a look at that. 15.1 and 15.2 have similar business rules because one's the aggregate and the other's the detail, Doug. Right. <clears> okay, <throat> question one from Linda. A student enrolled with us this year. Do I use their initial 504 date in 2019, even though other LAs have closed theirs in 2020. I think you can put a newer, the newer date. I'm not sure where that's documented, but. Should be in the data guide. Yeah. You don't, you don't have to use the old original date. Q1 from MyLED. Or me led? Well, but it represents the first date they were identified as a 504, but you have to renew it every so often to renew it annually. Yep. So use so the original date. Yeah. What was that? Don't use it? Use the original date. Even, oh, though, use the, the, re even though the previous LEA closed it out, still use the original date. Okay. Okay. The question one from Milan: How long is it going to generally take for the ODS to be updated? Uh, that's every every day that gets updated overnight when the system does its update. So every day you should have new ODS extracts or the information that you're expecting to be updated. If you're talking about reports or extracts. If you're talking about just online, if you were to upload something and post it, that would be updated online in, on, in online maintenance right as soon as it posts. But generally, it's an overnight thing. At 308, Angela posted the documentation for troubleshooting the SPED 543. Question one from Karen. For a student who enrolled in our in our building too for SPED services, but then de was determined not eligible, would their start and end date equal their parent consent date or the meeting date that they were found not eligible for services? I understand I should move them to my district level building, just stuck on what would the enrollment and exit date be? Is it the meeting date? Yeah, I will assume the meeting date. Yeah. <clears throat> but Not... but the when you obtain an SSID though, it would start with the parental consent, right? Yeah. And Alex has brought up the documentation. Oh, flash one sixty one. Flash one six sixty one. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in here, we say that the enrollment date should be the parental consent date. Yeah, you're highlighting. Oh, here it is. There it is. Yep. Yeah. And then if the student's found not eligible, then you would end 470. If, if the student is only for there for special education, correct? Not enrolled in the school. Correct. Not enrolled in the school. You're right. right. But if they are enrolled and they're found not eligible, um, 
then there's no exit on this bed and there's no exit on the enrollment. Correct. It has to be the education plan type 900 if they're not eligible. Great. Thanks, guys. Okay, next question one, Q1 from Kelly. <clears throat> Excuse me. This has been addressed a thousand times, but does the CDE have it in writing somewhere other than the one sentence on the summit of LPAC webpage? that the PG cannot opt a student out of the summit of LPACT and why? We have a parent who is determined to get their student out of EL seven months, three notifications and two assessments after having been determined eligible for services. I don't know. Is this a, a ticket we need to escalate to CDE? So. So I don't recall it ever being FAQ. It may be uh, an EL FAQ. They have a page, right? Yeah. Oh, Rebecca responded with something that might be helpful. Hope this helps parents or guardians of EL students have the right to decline or opt their children out of schools, EL programs, or out of particular EL services within an EL program. If the parents or guardians opt their children out of a school EL's program or specific EL services, the children retrain, retain their EL status. The school remains obligated to ensure the students learn English and achieve academically until reclassified as fluent English proficient. Wow. <laughs> Thanks, that, Rebecca. That makes it tough for the school, doesn't it? And at 319, Rebecca posted information guide for LPAC. And there's some more dialogue going back and forth. Thanks, everybody. Okay, and then uh, Q1 from Sean. I feel like I should know this one. Why are students that are indicated as matriculated and have enrolled in a high school district showing as dropouts on the ERD for our LEA? Thanks. Uh, well, that's a good question. They shouldn't be showing as dropouts on the ERD report if they ha do indeed have enrollment at their next school after they matriculated. Uh, might be one we want to take it on so we could just go through and see is there an issue with the ERD report right now? I'm not seeing any known issues uh, hmm. with that particular scenario. I mean, as long as they're re-enrolled before census day the next year, there should be no reason for them to be counted as dropouts. So it'd be interesting, it might be one we would want to take a look at. <clears throat> okay, I guess we'll go back up to the Q2 that we had from Mary. Does CalPAD still collect vocational ed course level one, two, three intro concentrator or participant capstone completer for CTE pathway courses? Vocational ed course level. I think that's the 23, 24. Instructional that, strategy. Yeah, wasn't that then Aries code that he, she's referring to, Alex? The vocational ed. So it's basically the instructional strategy 2324. 20, Which is dual credit. Yeah. But it's not intro concentrator. The ones that she listed are not the 2324. Oh. When they renumbered the CT courses to the 7,000, 8,000, um, they just put the word intermediate and capstone, right? In mm -hmm. kind of in the title. He says not instructional strategy 23 or 24, it's Aries level. Yeah. So those aren't needed in terms of cow pads here, because as Martha mentioned, there it's already embedded in the actual state course code. So I believe, and anybody else that uses Aries jump in here, but I believe that Aries has it to help you out with the uh, pathway management so that you can uh, use those uh, to identify internally, whether it's intro, capstone, 
or uh, concentrator. Good. And Stephanie says she believes that field is used for pathway management in ARIES. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Let's see. Okay. Okay, question one from Laura. Uh, can you point me to the document that clearly lays out how 504 should be reported to CalPATS? Uh, we have some confusion with eligibility start dates across districts, meaning we have students who qualified in elementary are now in secondary. Do we use that original start date or do we need to end the one from the elementary and open a new 504 with a new eligibility when they join the secondary district? Uh, and I think we said earlier, it is the, you should use the original date and the document was the data guided. And Alex is showing you right there. <clears throat> so the column on the right, it has best practice be evaluated annually. Okay, she says thanks. Okay, it's 324. Do we have any more questions? <laughs> oh, here we go. Thanks, Jean. Question one, is there any documentation beyond Flash 218 regarding use of the generic seed of the 10-9s for college professors teaching college credit dual credit classes? All training for CalPETS ind indicated this was okay. However, I'm being asked for more written doc documentation to show that if a generic seed in these cases is, in compliant, is compliant with CDE CalPETS guidelines. Uh, that is what our documentation says if you're using uh, and you can go to the FAQ, which Alex is showing us right now. When it says when it's okay to use the 999s. Yep. And for EOI1, it's not part of assignment monitoring. So you're not um, monitored on using the 999s. There's a couple of sections in the data guide on that topic as well. So two places to check, the FAQ and the data guide. Okay, question one from Kimberly. Will there be an incident reporting end of year three for NPS training like last year? Incident reporting training? Well, we have a recording on that. If you go back to the playlist, I think it was data population that we posted the NPS uh, recording yeah. right there. Okay, there you go. And at 325, Kyron posted that uh, link to the FAQ. Now it's 326 and we have no questions. <laughs> oh, here we go, another one. <coughs> Key one from Andrew. <clears throat> I have ARIES and there are duplicate records. I'm getting SACE errors when I'm finding that the local ID is incorrect. Can that be changed without failures? Uh, well, the local ID is just that. It's a, from local systems. CalPads, uh, if you change it locally, CalPads, as long as it's not been used before, how can I explain this? Uh, you should be fine. Well, why is, if he's there, he's, he's bringing up his special ed system. So is the problem that... The local ID that you're using as ARIES is in conflict with the local ID that you have in the special education system. You got to figure out mm. how to make those. Because uh, if you have duplicates inside of SACE, you don't want to have duplicate local IDs inside of SACE. You want to have unique local IDs as the same as in ARIES. So I'm not sure which local ID wins over. Maybe there's a SIS local ID and then there's a special ed local ID. I'm not sure. I think that's where where his question was headed. Mm. But coming into CalPads, I'm not sure CalPads would care what Correct. the local ID is. <laughs> right. Okay, my screen just popped up. So let's see. Not sure. Let's see. Mm. 
Q2 from Rebecca. Not sure if this is for your team or CDE. Will there be any more CalPads flashes being released? It has been a bit silent and there has been a lot coming out. Are we working on any flashes? I'm not we, but CDE. <laughs> Nothing in the immediate horizon. You know, with Brandy gone, with the shortage of staff and the turnover there, there hasn't been a immediate need for a uh, flash, but Paula is back. And so she's starting to take charge of identifying what needs to go out next communication wise, Rebecca. Uh, Martha, from the quarterlies, we did identify a need to tell people whether or not they should not be resolving NIDs while a student is testing, right? Is the guidance the same as it was um, last spring? Yeah. And, uh during that Q and A, uh, some a gentleman posted the link to ETS's site, and uh, they're not prohibiting the mids. I think it was like that at one point in time, but it's not that way anymore. I can uh, find that link. Uh, but Rebecca. I think they will put something together, like the big changes for what's going to happen in the 23-24 year. It's just we got to collect all of those pieces, and we had some outstanding uh, questions on some of the changes. But once we have all of that info, I think they'll uh, put something out. Okay. Uh, Q1 from Becky, BC. Are MPS still supposed to report to their LEA for them to report the incidents? Uh, yes. And Laura actually has some information there in a reply. Uh, <clears throat> and Kyron says yes as well. Thanks, Kyron. <laughs> uh, question one from Priscilla. Was the quarterly meeting for end of year last week recorded and available for viewing? Don't know if it was. We didn't was, record any quarterlies. Yep. But at 3.30, Angela posted, it's not recorded, but the materials are available here. And she has the link posted there for you. At 3.28, Andrew asks, can someone post the RD non-failure exit codes? And Kyron did that for you at 3.29. Question one from, or Q1 from Larni. We have a school for post-secondary continuing school for severely handicapped students. Typically, we only enroll students have completed 12th grade from our alternative and comprehensive schools, but would like to continue to this continuing school. My question is, can we enroll a severely handicapped to this school as an 11th grader because the IEP states this school is best for the student? Or are we only allowed to post-secondary enrollment? Thank you. I don't know. I would think that it depends on what CDS code that school has, right? Because sometimes the schools are just local schools and dummy schools, right? But their CDS code maps to like the district level, for example. So, so long as you can enroll the student in 11th grade at that school, I think it's fine. I think that the only caveat here is you can't tag those students in the 11th grade as adult age students with disabilities and transition status. So they would just be a regular 11th grader at that specific school. Okay, thanks, Alex. At 3.31, Martha posted the regarding the mid-resolution during LPAC testing link. Just to clarify, it says that uh, resolve the mid before you start testing. Because there's extra work if you do it, but it doesn't prohibit you from doing it. Yeah, it says you have to call their success agent and they'll have to do an SSID swap. It doesn't sound fun. It sounds like a little bit of a nosebleed. So uh, 
So resolve mids before they start testing is, is basically the message that they have. At 3.31, Marshall posted a link to the quarterly transcript. Mary Master says a Q3 at 3.33. When looking at exits for over 18-year-olds, mid-year, so they didn't really finish their 12th grade, until we get verification that they have gone to adult school or are pursuing a di diploma, should we use a T, I'm sorry, an E230-360 or a 400? Well, at the time that they left you, what did they say? Because I don't think E two thirty is appropriate if they. That's a completion code, right? Yeah. I I don't think you can use that three sixty. That means they went to an adult ed. That the adult ed people get to use that, not you. If you're sending, if the student's leaving. I'm thinking that's what three sixty is, but maybe I'm wrong. The completion code of not grad, I think. Oh, 360 is? Mm -hmm. They're missing requirements. So they're, the 360 is just missing requirements. But based on that, it's saying that they just, uh, they just didn't, uh, were just exited. Yeah, like so the yeah. difference, I think, is yeah. they stop coming to school and you have no idea what happened to them, right? That's yeah. the E-400 mm -hmm. versus they decided they're going off to join the military. So they left without, you know, earning enough credits for high school. I don't know. They, you know where they went, but uh, 400, you don't know what happened to them. Okay. Uh, Q2 from Dana. I have some ERDs for exit code E400. The students in question were under the age of six when they exited. They enrolled at the school the following year. Should I change these exit codes? And if so, to what? E450? I don't think it makes a difference, right? Because they're under underage. Yeah. And ERDs are not included in the formula for fall one and that percentage that of anomalies that need to be corrected. And I think E450 is specific to certain grade levels. Right. So depending on the grade level, they may not be able to change it. If it's a kinder, for example. Mm -hmm. So going back to Mary Masters and the uh, E30-360 versus a uh, 400, uh, I would agree with Carolyn. It's that they yet didn't finish their highest grade, or did they, when it was mid-year? Because usually at the end of the school year is when you're determined if you finished the school year or the that grade level. So I would say you couldn't use the 360 because they left mid-year. Mm -hmm. They didn't finish their highest grade. Unless they did, I don't know. You know the specifics of the student. Uh, 335, <clears throat> Michelle has a question. Uh, along with the topic, of resolving mids before start testing. And the screen just shot up. Hold on. Uh, what about if we have to change a start date? Submit a delete transaction and then submit the correct date. There will be no problem if this student has already started testing when the delete correction is submitted. So if you have to change the start date, you have to delete the record and put a new record in. Uh, I think if you do that all before the data goes over that night, <laughs> Right, you don't <laughs> want to delete the enrollment and not have anything in there for days. Yeah, as so long as you delete it and replace it with the correct one showing the enrollment during the day, it should be fine. Okay. 
Okay. I think, unless I missed anything, I think that's all the questions so far. 338, are there any more questions? If not, I'm going to beat Alex's record from last week. Hers was 342. <laughs> I, have a, I, have, I have a question, Gary. Is it ever okay. going to stop raining in California? I know. <laughs> I think they said there's another one headed our way. It's pounding outside now. At my it's rain. Oh, my. I was just for a while. I read in the news that they said, when can we expect 80 degree temperatures? They said, usually by the first week of April, we'll get our first 80 degree temperature. So in Sacramento, just for those of you that are not in Sacramento. Go from 60 <laughs> to 80 like that, huh? <laughs> yeah, me too, Cammie. Sunny and 70 degrees. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of us at CSIS are letting our lawns get out of control. <laughs> <laughs> this grass is too wet to cut. Dominic says, my dogs love the rain. I don't love when they tra what they trap in the house. Yeah. So I, I'm right there with you, Dominic. We have two doodles, and I will not let them in the backyard when it's raining. They have to go to their dog run. Pothole and mud slides to stop. Yikes. Uh, Sylvia says, uh, SW... Students with disabilities post-secondary status. Can he be enrolled with enrollment status 20? Secondary enrollment? No. Has to be primary. Has to be primary. Oh, wait a second. Are they talking about PSTS for end of year four? Or are they talking about That's adult age? That's how I was re interpreting okay. that. That's what we used to call it so so the prior year right is when uh they were with you and now you're going to survey them this year to see what happened to them and so do you survey students that were secondarily enrolled so we have an faq for that too ah. <laughs> right or is it a flash uh, yeah i believe there's there, there's there's definitely one that is a flash let me check that as well um, you mean you don't remember it off the top of your head? <laughs> We're getting rusty. No. <laughs> Two or three. Oh, got that. It's probably in the requirements, right? If you go look at the report, do we report? Secondarily enrolled. Or is that part of the report? We just report out on who gave us a survey, a PSTS record. We don't look to see what their prior year enrollment was. Oh, yeah. Uh, primary, secondary, and short term. Oh, yeah. There it is. Okay. Question from Ann. Is there an ETA for a flash regarding the new pathway to high school diplomas for students with disabilities? No, there is no ETA. They still have to get some. Uh, wait, this is the uh, students with disability. Joe, you may know better because you and Brandy are collaborating on that, right? Are you there, Joe? Are you in mute? Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm having some connection issues. It's probably the rain. Oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> but uh, we still don't have an ETA, unfortunately, but we're in in progress. Put it on in, in progress right now. All right. Any more questions? If not, I'm tied with Alex from last week. Now it's 342. Sorry, that was my fault, Gary. No, that's okay. <laughs> I was to blame for that one. Uh, All right. Well, thanks everyone for attending today's QA. We'll be back next week. Well, they will be back. I'm on vacation next week. Uh, or the QA next Wednesday at three o'clock.
Thanks, everyone. And see you later. Thanks, guys.